Thank you so much. I'm sorry for all the hassle. Um, okay, so interesting. Um, the this is the first time I'm giving this talk, and I've been thinking about it a lot. And it'll be great to get some feedback at the end. And I I do this not to discredit any of the work that has been done so far with respect to runtime systems and the way that we program systems. I think that has been the natural evolution of things. I just think that there are elements from that infrastructure that can be improved. And it's sort of like a motivation to try to do that. And the the whole talk is going to be part uh, divided in four parts. The first one is going to be a really naive analysis on some historical elements from sequential computing that I think are really important to really understand how we should be building parallel machines. Then the second part is just trying to understand what the current parallel runtime systems do and why do I think that there are problems in there. The third one is to introduce and argue about program execution models, and I'll get there when when that happens. And the part for, the part four is not really the purpose of this talk. The purpose of this talk is to say that we need a program execution model, but I'm just proposing one solution out there that may have some good elements to it, but not necessarily is going to be the best solution. And you can tear it apart and uh, complain about it. Uh, that's fine. Okay. So the, the first part is called, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And this is because in the evolution of sequential computing, we have been able to obtain parallelism. I mean, out of order execution engines usually take advantage of the data flow representation of instructions within a window to be able to understand what are the elements that can be executed in parallel. And we're able to do that thanks to the introduction of an instruction set, as we will see. But let me just take a really, really big leap backwards to try to understand what computers were meant for. Right? Like the first machines that we were creating back in the 1910s, 1920s, were how to create calculators. They didn't really understand all these concepts that we are seeing right now. They were just trying to understand how to take a set of, comput of, of computations that are usually represented almost as a data flow graph and how to try to um, put them into a machine that will be able to create these computations faster. And so if we take a look at one person using one of these machines, this is the uh, C CDC, um, the complex number calculator, CNC machine back in uh, 1939. Um, you 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 have to think of, of the machine, the, the calculator as our arithmetic logic unit. And there is one person that is sitting in front of that, that is taking decisions on based on the instructions that are meant to execute the particular uh, arithmetic computation. What are the elements that you're going to take and scaling those instructions into the calculator? I mean, we all have used calculators and we are really, really familiar with this process where we have uh, one notebook with the operation that we want to do and we choose one element at a time, and we start adding them into quote unquote the registers of the calculator, and we put one of them at a time, and then we write down the result of the, that element, right? And then we take the next operation, and we take the next operand, and we get the final result, right? And so if we take a look at, at this infrastructure that we have here, what we have on the left is the ALU plus registers, and what we have on the right is the memory as expected, but what we have as, as person that is taking decisions with respect to the instructions that need to be executed, we are doing some process of fetching, decoding, and scaling of instructions that is really important in the process of how we compute uh, numbers. And later on in history, we do see the introduction, sorry for that, but supposed to be the fetch decode unit on the back of the rack. Uh, this is the EdSec machine in 1949. We do see that back in the days, we were not really thinking of instructions and architectures and programming languages. We we're thinking of, now we have these components, we have IO, we have registers, we have arithmetic logic units. How do we connect them to create machines? And right now we have a kind of a similar problem in the sense that we are looking into heterogeneous computation, we have all these components and we are trying to understand how to really connect those components together. And the way that we are gluing them together is through the use of runtime systems. And I will explain that in a second. So the first learning that I have is something really basic to all of us is that computers always require an scaling mechanism around a, a set of compute units and in sequential computation, that is the ALU. Okay, 
Then we look at the history of the evolution of software and hardware. Of course, we have to mention Turing machine, we have to mention the von Neumann architecture, but we also have to mention the ISA, they're supposed to be divided into two, the dots are in the line. Um, the, the introduction of the ISA by, by uh, IBM 360 was the one that actually split up the possibility of creating multiple machines and be able to port the software without having to redo all the elements back and forth. And it created a divergence in between the software and the hardware that allowed both of those components to grow apart and to, to be explored without having to interact one and the other. And we have lost that ability because now, every time that we are thinking of parallelizing elements, we have to think so hard of how the machine works we have to think so hard on how the runtime interacts with the machine that we are now having to understand every single component of the machine again. And we, it, the, the whole concept of portability, programmability, and performance being really important is a discussion that we are having constantly and we are still not able to find a solution to that. Okay, so we may be able to need something that divides and separates the description of the computation from the description of the machine and the behavior of the machine. And operating systems have been really good at being able to, to take advantage of this, because if you think of each of the processes, sequential processes, the, the view that the programmer has of the machine is not too different from the actual machine. The abstraction of the machine in the minds of the programmer for a sequential programmer is that the one of a memory or CPU and the OS runtime doesn't really change the abstraction of the machine with respect to the actual machine that is running. Right? So the OS runtime, all it's doing is switching back in between one and other process, back and forth in between one and other process to be able to schedule that abstraction of the process into the abstraction of the real machine. And so the learning number two here is that instruction set architectures, they standardize programs for a large collection of mechanisms, and this is called portability. So instruction set architectures as a common layer for the for the machine, regardless of the implementation of the machine, allowed for programs to be able to execute it in between one generation and the other. Of course, with some exceptions, ex exceptions, but we can talk about that later. Okay, but then I learned number three is that the OS runtime system, they does not have to change the, mach the machine abstraction, but rather orchestrate the execution of the process that has the same machine abstraction of the machine, and that process respects the abstraction of the machine. Um, I have been saying abstraction of the machine a lot. I have to explain that one a little bit more. I'll get to that in a second. So let's go to a part two, the parallel runtime systems. So what really is an abstract machine? An abstract machine corresponds to the components of the system, how the components are connected, but not necessarily how they are implemented in, in one specific architecture or the other. I mean, if I say a table has the tabletop and, and some number of legs, or if I say a car has four wheels and a chassis, that is some sort of way of thinking of the abstract machine that you can think of a computer as a set of components that you do not have to change in order to create the machine, even though that when you create the machine, you may be able to optimize and improve each of those components in a separate way. And von Neumann was able to create that for sequential computers. You have a memory, you have a CPU, you have a connection between the two. You don't have to think anywhere further from there. And all the sequential programming languages, with some exception, exceptions of that, are thinking like the programmer has that vision of the machine and that vision of this, the machine doesn't change. So let's try to take a look at OpenMP to see if that is the case, right? So we have here a really simple OpenMP program. On the bottom, we have a real system that has two discrete set of memories. We have the device memory and we have the host memory. We have in the device a set of GPU uh, streaming multiprocessors, and we have in the in the host a set of cores. And we create first. We start with a required signature memory. Immediately, I already change the view of the real machine with respect to the actual machine. Then I create an OpenMP parallel sections that allows me to create multiple v multiple sections of of um, code that are going to be executed in different threads. I have a first section that uses an OMP parallel num threads followed by an OMP single followed by, by an OMP, num, OMP tasks. And immediately the programmer has to think of a task queue. It has to think of an scheduler and it has to think of the threads that are assigned to that group of cores. In this case, this number of threads equal to two. So the programmer has to imagine that there is some, something in the machine that is able to schedule the tasks. 
At the same time, I create a second section that is just a parallel region, right? And that second section tells me that I have four cores and I have to imagine that I always have four cores or I have to imagine that sometimes maybe I don't have four cores and sometimes maybe I have four cores and immediately I'm changing the view that I have of the machine. And on top of that, I have a target region that again, changes the view that I have of the machine, right? So this, this idea of, of respecting the machine abstraction is important, but it's also, it sounds really dumb in a way, right? Because I'm just talking about like, cars have four wheels and a chassis, and it's really like, we just need to respect the view of the machine and the system, okay? So who really connects the view of the abstract machine in the software and the view of the real machine is this runtime system that emulates the behavior of a machine that doesn't really exist. The runtime system has to create queues. The runtime system has to create a scaling. The runtime system has to oversubscribe the, the number of threads. And the more runtime system we have, the more complex that, that supposed machine uh, that, that doesn't really exist in the hardware uh, is, right? And so let's try to go to extreme. Let's try to say, I am a developer, right? And I am going to create a really large software and I want to create parallelism. So I decide to use OpenMP runtime, but I found one library that is for, um, let's say a matrix multiplication and that library uses OpenMP. I found another library that is for FFT and that one uses Raja and another one that uses Coco and another one that uses Legion. Everyone that knows about how to program parallel systems, they will be like, no, there is no way you can do it. You are going to have all the issues in the world, right? So now we have to think of interoperability, which is not a bug, it's a feature, right? So we have to think of all the possible combinations of all the possible runtimes that we have to be able to understand how the abstract machine of one runtime combines with the abstract machine of another runtime. And now we have to somehow negotiate how who takes over what of the system, right? Okay, learning number four. Multiple runtimes that implement different abstract machines assume full ownership of the system. They think that they are the whole owners of the system. And then when we put them together, they are going to collide with each other. And this is sort of like common sense. It's not really um, that, that crazy to think. So Jack Dennis, back in 1998, he created a paper that is titled A Parallel Program Execution Model Supporting Modular Software Construction. And he says six Modular, modularity principles that are pretty much all broken by current runtime systems. I'm going to focus on information hiding and invariant behavior. So information hiding says that the user of the module is not supposed to know anything about the information that flows and happens inside of the module. And invariant behavior says that when I execute something, the execution of that module should not depend on the place where I place the module. So it's not like if I create an OpenMP library and I try to use that OpenMP library into an OpenMP program and now have to consider that I was using OpenMP in the library, that I have to enable uh, nested parallelism, that I have to consider the oversubscription of threads, and that I have to consider the, the, ele the elements that are surrounding that model in order to understand how that particular model is going to behave. There are other elements here. You can go and take a look at the paper. But what is important here is that the learning 4.1 is current runtime systems. They break principles of software modularity completely, okay? So with that being said, let's move into part three. So program execution models, let's begin with the, the gods of program execution models, Jack Dennis and Guang Gao. They have already defined these two elements in multiple uh, papers where they say that a program execution model is the specification of how the program interacts with the machine. Considering the machine not as a real machine, as a specific construction of the machine, but rather considering the machine as an abstraction of the machine. It's similar to how we think of von Neumann, how we think of sequential code, and we immediately go, jump into von Neumann and we immediately think of memory and CPU. The idea here is that a well-defined program execution model should affect the hardware, it should affect the compiler, it should affect the operating system, and it should affect the programming models because it changes the way that we envision the system and it separates the creation of the interface of how to create a program versus how that program interacts with, an, with a specific machine abstraction. Okay, so why is this important? Because in reality, program execution models are not meant to be 
implemented in runtime, even though that we have implemented program execution models in runtime, they are not being meant to be implemented as a specific software with a specific programming language, right? They are meant to be the underlying tool of the system as a whole. They are meant to modify the architecture, the compiler and the OS systems. They specify a unique machine abstraction that should be kept across all the programs in the system and across all the actors in the system. And they define a semantical behavior of that machine that is completely different, independent from the syntax and the semantics of the application itself, right? So it, change, it makes a clear distinction between what the programmer is trying to say with respect to the mathematical computation of the program versus how the mathematical computation actually maps into the machine. And it creates well-defined unique uh, uh, components of the machine in the abstraction of the machine, similar to how to use schedule uh, instructions, similar to how you compute how you have instructions that are for computation and how you have instructions that are for memory. Okay, so going back to this image, we have a well-defined program execution model that allows an operating system to not change the, the abstract machine and still map the program into the into the system, okay? So here is a research question that is still not solved, is what is an appropriate program execution model that respects the principles of modularity and that can be used for parallel, extremely heterogeneous and distributed systems? Okay, let's try to understand a little bit of some success cases that we already see. AI animal frameworks are beautiful because they separate the description of the neural network from where you actually execute that neural network. So you take some program in TensorFlow, you specify it in Python, right? That program is translated into an intermediate representation that the compiler can later on decide, oh, this instruction I'm going to execute it in the GPU, this instruction I'm going to execute it in the CPU, or I'm going to use a static, a, a static scheduling, or I'm going to use a dynamic scheduling. So there is a clear distinction between what the program is versus how that program executes in the machine. The second use, uh, success case is a paper by Johannes Dörfer that is called Breaking the Vendor Lock, where he demonstrates that it is possible to take advantage of the current OpenMP runtime system in, in LLVM to target multiple programming languages, right? So you take CUDA, as long as the, the lowering of that CUDA respects the same API of the OpenMP runtime, you do not have to have a CUDA specific runtime. The problem is that this is a single runtime to roll them on. It is still not living underneath in the operating system, and it is still not living underneath into the architecture itself. But it shows that by creating well-defined abstraction of how parallelism should work, we are able to separate the syntax of the program versus the execution of that syntax. Okay. So learning number five is that we need a universal program execution model that decouples the application semantics from the machine abstraction and the program execution itself, meaning how that particular application semantics are mapped into the program execution model. Okay, so that being said, the color model is just a solution. I encourage you to try to find different ways that you can express this. So what is a colet? A colet is almost yet another word for tasks, but not quite. So task, if you take something like an OpenMP task, you only consider a scaling point of a function that may have some de some control dependencies with respect to a previous function in the program. But inside of the OpenMP task, you can have a pointer that touch any region of memory. You can have side effects and you can even create new tasks and you can do whatever. You can put windows in an OpenMP task and the specification will be, okay, that's completely fine. So here in, in Coalets, we are talking about pure tasks, meaning that they describe a pure function that are closer to a, to a data flow actor. So the output of that particular task only depends on the inputs. And there is no safe state, safe internal state in the execution of that particular task. Once you schedule that task, it is atomically executed from beginning to end. So think of this as how an arithmetic instruction happens to be in the instruction set architecture. Right, you have an add instruction, it only depends on the input registers and it gives you an output register. Can I create non-deterministic programs based on that? Yes, I can. Can I use um, that particular unit of computation to create some more complex arithmetics? Yes, I can. So in a similar way, we're creating building blocks that respect a specific function that we can later on use to, exp to express parallelism. Okay. 
when we talk about the sequential coded model that is a specific implementation of this, what we do is we take a data flow graph and we sequentialize the data flow graph using sequential semantics. And we use register names, not to refer to 32, 64, 512 registers, but to refer to specific main memory locations that represent data dependencies between one task and the other, okay? So the idea here is that if we already, if we are already familiar with the, with the traditional fetch decode, execute, Dive back and memory access five stages pipeline, we can actually take a similar five stages pipeline and build it completely on top of already existing architectures such that I can have a task description program that each of those tasks are actually correlates that are well defined in behavior and they only depend on the inputs and outputs that are register names that are going to be falling on this L1 register file that I'm that I'm have here, right? So a, uh, a collet will be fetched, it will be decoded, and it will be assigned to a specific collet execution unit. That collet execution unit will be representing all the functionality of that particular program. It will be assigned to the lower level community architecture, and it will go into one instruction at a time. All the memory accesses that happen within that collet are going to be falling within this register file. Okay? so. That means that I first lock the behavior of the, of the code as a function, but then I also lock the latency of the code by restricting which memory I'm trying to access, okay? That also means that I'm going to have to end up with three different types of code. I need a compute code that maps to an architecture. I need a memory code that allows me to control and perform memory operations. And I need a control flow instructions that allows me to build more complex data flow graphs. So going back to the sequential instructions, control flow instructions allow me to build data flow graphs. So when you, when you take a representation of a control flow graph, each of the basic blocks has a unique data flow graph. The possibility of one basic block jumping into another basic block means that you are trying to connect one data flow graph in one basic block to potentially other data flow graph in another basic block. Meaning that the live out analysis of one data flow graph and the live in analysis of the other data flow graph are the one elements that I, during runtime, I'm going to determine which parts of the data flow graph are connected. Saying it differently, the out of order execution engine does not concern about control instructions. The out of order execution engine only concerns about a specific register name and how can we take advantage of the of the parallelism of a data flow graph. Okay, so this is a very simple example where we have a loop and we have this correlate instruction here that is a vector add correlate instruction. We are doing some load operations into, um, into the L1 register file. We are placing that big chunk of memory into the L1, and then we are firing the code. So we can even change the execution of this to be single cycle or to be pipeline or to be out of order execution or to have super scalar behavior. And it will be the same representation of the program. There is a paper on this. You can go and take a look at it for, for the sake of time. I, I have to jump. There is also matrix multiplication example here where I have this load square tiles um, coilets that are line six, seven and line nine that are only the only intention of those credits is to be able to move data from an unstructured memory region in the memory into a structured memory region into a register file such that the colon, the multiplication code in number nine can actually go in and perform the 128 by 120 operation into a single tile of the matrix multiplication and you can see how these are techniques that you have used already in parallel execution of programs so let's there is a, a preprint made by a dozen folks, a student that is also here in, in the room. He, um, and I have been going around this idea of having memory collets and the things that we can do in memory collets. Some of the elements being that we can do um, fetching, right? Meaning that we can move the data before doing the computation. We can do recording, that is taking the data, modifying the color of that or the information of that data and placing it into a register similar to near memory compute. We can do uh, movements in between an already existing um, coilet and an, a coilet execution unit and another coilet execution unit. And more interestingly, we can do streaming that allows, to, allows, allows us to overlap the execution of one coilet with respect to another coilet. 
okay? And there is another paper that we wrote that is on the idea of chiplets and the color model. And this, the idea here is that we have an extremely parallel chiplet architecture, but we right now we only have the possibility of using runtimes to be able to come to connect the different uh, architectures and we will have to use something like an offloading model that uh, is able to offload to different parts of the architecture but it becomes really difficult to understand the mapping of that but if we had a colored program where we knew one color would, would be specific for a specific architecture we can do the fetch operation and we can decide where to place that color even during runtime we can decide okay this this case i'm trying to do low energy so i'm going to use the low energy color and i'm going to place my color into the low energy cpu such that i can take advantage of the of the color okay so those two are our preprints that are uh, pretty interesting you can take a look at that just to summarize the idea here is that computers always require an scalar mechanism the coilet model uses an scalar unit to be able to understand how to map the coilets into a computation. Instruction set act architectures is standardized programs for a large collection of machines. The idea here is that the sequential coilet model can work as an instruction set architecture that can be mapped to multiple architectures itself. <laughs> OS runtime does not, need, does not change the machine abstraction. We are trying to separate the definition of the program from the abstract machine of that particular program and multiple runtimes implement different abstract machines. So we want to be able to have a single view of the system, a single program execution model, such that we don't break uh, modularity in the software. And that will be it. Um, I'm open to any questions, suggestions too, because I need to repeat this talk soon. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. You can probably take the microphone, otherwise the online audio is great. Uh, if, yeah, just, it's okay. It's, uh, yeah. uh, it seems like one of the problems is that we have been taking uh, parts that have been designed for general purpose, uh, trying to put together supercomputers, and there is not like a, a full or integrated design for supercomputers or computers in general for heterogeneous architectures. Uh, what do you think is a solution to generate like a more generic view of the system? So in, in my head, there is this idea of hierarchical organization. I only showed a single level from commodity architectures to L1. But if you take, for example, uh, workflows, that is a new topic that is gonna be kind of like a hot topic recently. Um, the idea of workflows, already uses description of data flow um, workflows, right? Like, so they have tasks and they are thinking of how to move the, task, the data from one task to the other. But there is no concept often of control flow instructions that allows me to make smarter decisions with respect to my workflow. So if I want to have like a self-driving lab, I need to have something like a, like a, the possibility of having control flow decisions that allows me to build different data flow graphs. So we need to build on top of this hierarchical organization more and more complexity, such that we can um, such that we can take advantage of the um, the description of the of the computation of that particular level and the uh, possibility of changing the the connection of that data flow graph to the use of control flow instructions. Um, we have a do we have more questions here before I jump? So I, I just want to say, uh, so I assume you're trying to uh, say there should be a generic model to program these systems. I guess I've heard the other argument that we now need to build application-specific supercomputers for specific problems, um, which seems to contradict, but I assume there's like a scenario where this is better, and that's what I'm curious about. So I, there is something in, in that argument that is similar to MLIR, right? the idea of progressive loading. You have domain specific uh, languages that allows you to take advantage of the semantics in that particular level to optimize the application before lowering into an yet another level that has different semantics. I, I believe that there is some use in that. 
But the applications in the high level, similar to the, the example I had in MLIR uh, um, TensorFlow, shouldn't be concerned about how the architecture is constructed, but rather how the um, the instructions are connected, the different comp mathematical, the different instructions with a specific mathematical meaning are connected to, to pro in between a producer and a consumer are connected with each other. Does that make sense? Okay, so no, we can talk, okay. <laughs> Bring up that. Okay. So the, the, the idea here is that if you were to have a sequential program like the one that I showed, if you do something like loop and rolling and you end up with a specific data flow graph when, after you do that loop and rolling, you can later on decide to have a static, a static scaling during compilation that maps to a mesh architecture, for example. Right, so that is a specific example of how you can separate the description of the program to the actual machine that implements that program. 